Okay, um, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the inaugural lecture of our Cities Against Nationalism speaker series, launched in conjunction with the Jerusalem 2050 Vision of the City as a Place of Peace project, jointly sponsored by the Department of Urban Studies and Planning and the Center for International Studies at MIT. This speaker series is also offered in tandem with a course titled City Visions Past and Present, co-taught by Larry Vale and me this semester. And if I could be, without being too disruptive, I'd like to make a quick announcement that the readings for Wednesday are available in a box here in CDD as a stopgap measure and that will tide us over until all the course readings are on Stellar. Um, I think I speak for most of us here when I say we're very excited to have as our first speaker Professor Gerald Frug of the Harvard Law School. But before I announce him more deliberately and carefully, I would like to take a few minutes to introduce you to the aims of the seminar series, how they connect to the Jerusalem Project, and why we think this speaker series is a good one to stand in for the City Design and Development Group Monday evening lecture series. Um, almost one year ago, Professor Dick Samuels, who's here, the director of the Center for International Studies, was approached by two peace activists from the greater Jerusalem area with long connections to MIT, one Palestinian and one Israeli, who had come to visit out of exasperation with the difficult and conflicted situation in the city of Jerusalem, and who were committed to exploring new avenues for peace in the region. One idea that particularly appealed to them was the importance of thinking about how to create peace in the city of Jerusalem. The project that then emerged out of a series of conversations with them and a group of faculty from political science, from urban studies and planning and architecture, including Dick Samuels, Larry Vale, John DeMancho, Bish Sanyal, Josh Cohen, Carolyn Makinson, and myself, was the idea of thinking imaginatively about Jerusalem 50 years down the road and what it might take in terms of institutions, spatial patterns, social practices, economic dynamics, etc., to make that a city of peace, one where difference and diversity could coexist without devolving into intractable and violent conflict. This rather utopian project, something we reformulated in the subtitle of this seminar series with the phrase, Urbanism as Visionary Politics, not only challenges scholars who are interested in designing cities, it also serves as an invitation and an opportunity to engage scholars who are interested in designing political institutions and social practices that can promote democratic deliberation and dialogue, even as it fixes those ideas and visions in space, and in this instance, a particular urban space, which is Jerusalem. We are hopeful that the conversation that we will begin in this seminar series will ultimately lead to new forms of interaction, discussion, and engagement that can help us understand both the possibilities and the constraints to be encountered as we envision a future of peace for Jerusalem. We also hope that the ideas generated in the presentations and the commentaries can be parlayed into a discussion about how to mount a juried international design competition that would solicit a variety of visions for Jerusalem in the year 2050. I, I think that most of us involved in the project also feel that, in this case, the journey is as important as the outcome. And then in thinking about what it would take to make Jerusalem a peaceful city, we can spark new insights and creativities for the present period and not merely the future. Now, no doubt many of you are wondering how all this relates to the theme of cities against nationalism that defines the spring, this spring speaker series. And very simply, the logic is that the discussion we launched last fall in a CIS-sponsored Cities in Conflict study group in which we examine divided and conflicted cities as a general theme, the consensus, a consensus among the participants emerged that some of the most intractable and enduring conflicts found their roots in ethnic, racial, or religious conflicts that were deeply embedded in historical struggles over national sovereignty and the right to govern one's own territory. As such, in many of the violent contested cities we studied, ranging from Belfast to Berlin to Mostar to Jerusalem, questions about whose nation state would prevail in what location frequently defined the terms of conflict and negotiation in the obdurate struggles. And this realization inspired us to pose the following counterfactual question to ourselves and to our invited speakers. 
If the superimposition of nationalist projects and aspirations on ethnically or religiously diverse urban locales like Jerusalem is what fans the flames of aggression and violent conflict, then could concerted efforts to liberate cities from those nationalist blueprints serve as the solution? or at minimum help lay a partial foundation for greater tolerance and perhaps even peace? If so, how precisely could or should this be accomplished? What would it take to do that? Are there new constraints, excuse me, constructs of place, function, urban meaning to be imagined? Alternative uses of space and technology to be proposed? or heretofore untapped networks of individuals and institutions to be envisioned that might reconcile or subvert contending nationalist claims sufficiently to establish a genuinely diverse, tolerant, and self-determining city. Stated differently and in the lingo of Nancy Fraser as a political theorist's idea of the politics of recognition, should the politics of recognition be applied to the city of Jerusalem and not necessarily to the ethnic or religious peoples that struggle to call it their home? And what would it take to realize that vision? So to help us think about these questions, we invited a series of political and legal theorists, urbanists, historians, and other scholars interested in cities, nationalism, democracy, and peace to help us start the discussion. We are most honored, then, to have as our first luminary in the sparkling array of stars that will be coming through this semester, Professor Gerald Frug of the Harvard Law School. Professor Frug is a Louis D. Brandeis Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and a specialist on legal problems of local government and legal theory, and has published numerous articles that are of great relevance to all of us here, including Beyond Regional Government, um, The Geography of Community, Decentraling, excuse me, decentering decentralization, among other articles. He is also the author of the award-winning book titled City Making, Building Communities Without Building Walls, a discussion of how legal powers and divided jurisdictions of municipalities can produce division and separation. One of Professor Frug's aims in the book has been to offer an alternative vision of cities' legal powers, one that promotes local decisions while while rec or local decision making while recognizing the connections cities within a single region have with each other. As with many of our invitees, we do not expect Professor Frug's commentary to directly focus on Jerusalem, but rather to take up some of the larger framing concerns of the seminar series. Still, we are very fortunate to have Professor Nomi Hassan here to my left, a Wilhelm Fellow at the Center for International Studies, a professor of political science, a former member of the Israeli Neset, and if I might add, a former candidate for the mayor of Jerusalem, serving as a commentator and hopefully permanent participant in the series. And Professor Hassan will follow Professor Frug with some further thoughts, and after which we'll open up the floor for discussion and questions. And so without further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to Professor Gerald Frug. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming. It's, uh, I want to say some things, mostly about cities and nationalism. I'll mention Jerusalem, but you know more about Jerusalem than I do, so uh, I won't be focusing on Jerusalem. But I want to think about cities and nationalism. And one thing, in, in order to do that, I think we have to think about the word city has two different meanings. Uh, and one meaning of the word city is the city is a place. Uh, when people say things like Boston is a nice place to live or Jerusalem is uh, the center for three religions, they're talking about a location, uh, a group of people who live in the, in the same place. And if you think about it in that way, you can see a lot of these cities seem to be escaping the nation state in many different ways. One is people from all over the world now live in these places. So one out of every six people in the city of Boston is a foreign national. And the percentage is much higher than elsewhere in the United States. So the, a lot of immigrants have relations around the world. But it's not just that. A lot of the business people in cities like New York and London have more to do with each other than they do with people in their own country. And so at all levels of society, these places, places like London, places like New York, uh, begin to feel very different from the rest of the country. They feel closer to each other, closer to 
large parts of the world, and you can then see what people talk about, and there's a literature about this, which is actually quite convincing, about how cities, cities seem to be emerging from the nation state as something different from the nation in which they're, they're uh, located. Uh, and that the other thing that's happening, and something we won't talk about here, is larger than the nation states, things like the European Union. So in this sense of the city, there's a lot to be said about the cities escaping from nationalism. I think it's uh, one way to think about it is the, to recognize that London is closer to New York than it is to Liverpool. Uh, there's more relations. People in London and New York know more about each other than they know about places in their own, own state. So in this sense of the word city, city is a place with lots of people living in this way. Uh, you can see how cities begin to look very, very different from the nation and might be able to be thought of as against nationalism. But there's another definition of the word city, and that is the city is a legal concept. And when you think about, and, and when I'm talking about the city as a legal concept, I'm talking about the government. Cities have power to do things. They tax people. They regulate. They have a jurisdiction over which they have authority. And outside of that jurisdiction, they have no authority. Where do they get the power? They can be sued, and they sue. Cities are government. So you talk about, you talk about Boston. You could be meaning the city government of Boston and what its power is. That's the legal concept. Or you could mean you know, some place you can walk to uh, just across the bridge, uh, a very different idea. If you think about the city as the legal concept, I don't think there's any way to escape the nation state. Where do cities get their power? And the answer, certainly in the United States, is they get the, the power from and here the word state is kind of a funny word. What we, I mean by the word state here is American states. The city of Boston gets its power from the state of Massachusetts. The city of Boston has no power to do anything at all if the state of Massachusetts doesn't give it its power. So can the city tax? Can it regulate? What can it do? Can it sue? Can it be sued? Where does it get its money? What services to provide? All that it does comes from the state. And in a lot of places, it comes from the nation itself. Uh, so on the one hand, you can think of New York and London escaping the nation and having kind of rising above the nation. This is in the, in the first place. And in that sense, having power, economic power, and political influence in the world, uh, which the nation can't control. But then if you move to the legal concept, you will see that New York and London have no power not given them by the nation state or, or in the United States by one of the 50 states. So uh, Thatcher abolished the city government in London, just abolished it. And if you focus on things like the uh, ground zero, the ability of the city of New York to control what's going on in the, in the city What's going to happen in that location? Or if you think about the subways of the city of New York, the city of New York doesn't run its own subway system. It's run by a state agency appointed by the governor. So if you focus on the city as a legal concept, it's a much more complicated question to try to figure out what the relationship is between cities and nationalism. Uh, so th now one thing is, there have been efforts to try to create cities as if they're nations. So kind of the one, one, one idea that you might have, and we'll get back to this, is having the city seen as seceding from the nation, becoming its own nation in some way. This is the idea that there historically have been a number of city-states, which are cities and states all together. And there are now city-states uh, around the world. But these tend to be places, most of the city-states arose in places where there are no powerful nation-states already present. City-states preceded the nation-state in a lot, of, a lot of places. And the idea of creating a city kind of entity wouldn't, the nation-states are not going to just go along with it. Uh, the nation states are going to have something to say about the city's power, which would, they would experience as 
to secede, to secede from the nation in order to create its own jurisdiction. Uh, so uh, although there's been efforts to do that, uh, it doesn't seem uh, to me very likely in a very contested area. We'll get back to secession uh, later. So the question is, what do we do then? We now have the city located in the nation state and getting its power from the nation state. How do we protect cities from nations? Well, there's a traditional idea, which is local autonomy. It's what we call here in the United States, here in Boston, home rule. There's this old idea that you can give cities autonomy over certain items. Those they can control. And then the, 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 the larger unit, the state, like Massachusetts, the nation, like the United States, will do things that control larger ideas. The traditional way of thinking about the relationship between cities and nation states is that. Home rule, local autonomy. What I want to tell you is I don't believe in it. I don't think it works. It's not the way to do it. Why is that? Well, the problem with home rule is that people give home rule to places. Like if you imagine home rule for the city of Boston, you're only going to give home rule for local matters. You're only going to give home rule to, to Boston for things that deal only with Boston. You're not going to let Boston control the destiny of outsiders. But then if you begin to think, what is it that Boston can do that affects only the city of Boston? The answer is virtually nothing. The amount of affordable housing that Boston offers affects the housing across the state. The people that Boston educates, the people that other cities, but there's 101 cities in the Boston metropolitan area. The, the, the people that any of them educate move across borders. Transportation moves across borders. You try to think of something that only that the city does that doesn't affect outsiders, and the problem is it's not easy to do. Uh, so. The, the, the law of home rule has evolved over time so that there's this basic principle. The city can do whatever affects only the locals. The state can do the, whatever affects more than the locals. And that division has created an enormous amount of state power over cities. This is where state power gets generated because more and more questions uh, are understood as affecting uh, people uh, inside, outside, just tourists that come in and out. Uh, the way this works in regionalism, so I've done money, uh, some, some work on uh, the 101 cities in this, uh, that make up the Boston region. And the way th this affects regionalism is one of the old ideas was to have one regional government for all of the regions, which is just expanding the city border to cover the Boston metropolitan region. For 100 years, most people realize this is not going to happen, certainly not in the United States. So what they thought of as having two-tier regionalism. There would be a regional government for regional issues and local government for local issues. You should recognize this is exactly the same formulation as home rule versus the state and has exactly the same problem. If you open a Walmart, in one suburb, it will destroy the downtown business district in the next suburb. Everyone recognizes that. And therefore, the giving the control of, one, uh, of, of that type of decision to one suburb affects its neighbors. Uh, and so there's a problem with two-tier regionalism, in my opinion, just like there's a problem with home rule autonomy. Uh, so we need another idea. What I want to talk about is another idea, another way of putting the city together with nations. So what I want to discard is the city somehow making the nation disappear, or the city carving out an area that's all its own. There has to be another idea. Where does this, what is this idea? Well, 
what I want you to recognize about the nation state, now, now I'm going to move basically to, to local government law. I want to talk about the United States, uh, which is what I know about. And I, I want you to, think, to realize that if you think about, for example, the state of Massachusetts, it is made up of its localities. There is no such thing as the state of Massachusetts that's not the collection of its localities. So if the localities, all of the different cities, and you'd have to include, of course, in places like Massachusetts rural areas, but 80% of Americans live in metropolitan areas. Almost everybody in America lives in cities. So we're mostly talking about people in cities. If the people in cities got together, they would be the nation state. They would be the nation state. There's no such thing as a nation state independent of the collection of cities. So if you start with that, then the question is, how do we get the cities to work together so that they can pursue their own agendas? And the answer to that is that they have to begin to talk to each other about how they affect each other and how the rule systems that are currently in place make them now competitors against each other rather than allies. I mean, right now, and this is just a matter of state law, right now, this, the uh, cities are dependent on very limited sources of revenue, mostly property tax in Massachusetts, uh, very limited sources of revenue. That's because state law gives them only that amount of revenue. And therefore, they compete for each, with each other for revenue. And therefore, they see each other not as allies, but as competitors. You could organize a different kind of finance system that didn't make cities so competitive. For example, you could recognize that the property tax that comes from a mall, shopped at by everybody across the region, need not go to the place next to the mall. A lot of people don't even know where the, the jurisdiction where the mall is located when they go shop there. It's so to, if you understood the tax system on malls as being regional, the p money coming from the region and going from the region, they would not be as competitive. Uh, the same is true with exclusionary zoning. A lot of the suburbs in, in Boston have been given authority, and again, you have to recognize this is from state law, have been given authority to engage in exclusionary zoning, by which we mean uh, they have a very, very little affordable housing. But in order to engage in exclusion, the excluded go somewhere. And therefore, there have to be places that are open in order for there to be places that are closed. Uh, a different housing system and an organizational system uh, would make a change in this. So what do I propose? What, I, what I've proposed for metropolitan America is I propose what I've called a regional legislature, but you can think of as a you can think of as a large-scale regional planning organization made up of the region's cities, designed to work together to create a better legal system for themselves and to devolve more power to themselves. In the United States, there is no organization in which the cities, as such, get together and negotiate with each other over how they're affecting each other. State legislators are organized by districts that don't follow city lines. Congressmen are organized by districts that don't follow city lines. So I propose, and I could go into this, I think it's a little bit of a tangent, but if you want to hear about this legislature, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, but what I proposed is a collective organization organized democratically, namely the big cities have more representatives than the small cities. This is a one person, one vote organization, but organized by cities in which the cities renegotiate the rules that affect their lives. Rules about how housing is allocated, rules how finance is allocated, rules about how the, why good schools are someplace and not others, rules about transportation. I want the cities to begin to work to each other. How are we going to get the state legislature to empower a regional organization to do this? If you go back to the idea that if the cities together wanted it, they would control the state. More than half of the people in the Boston, in Massachusetts, live in the Boston area. It's because the cities fight with each other that they lose power against the state. Now, so 
how would this work internationally or someplace else? Let's move the topic. I mean, I'm happy to expand more on regional legislature if you want me to, but I want, what's the basic core notion here? The core notion is for cities to gain power, they have to work with people outside the borders. It's not a question of just working with people within the borders and then sealing their borders. Then they become another nation and you have basically the relationship with outsiders becoming something like international law. What you have to do is you have to organize with other cities who also want their own power and also have their own problems with central government and also want self-determination in a way, but not self-determination in the sense of everybody can decide what they want on their own. It has to be self-determination in some negotiated sense in which all of the impacts of everybody has on each other are worked out in a negotiation. No one is going to be happy with the results, 100 percent. But we don't need unanimous consent in these ideas. What we, what we need is a legislature with, through some majoritarian democratic process, can work out a place, a, a situation in which more power can be uh, delegated. So what, what I urge you then to focus on is some institution, if you think about, I don't know whether, to, I don't even know to what extent this is relevant to Jerusalem. The, wh why it, why I located in uh, metropolitan America is most jurisdictions are now being hurt. A great majority of the jurisdictions in the metropolitan area, it's not just a question of cities versus suburbs, because there are a lot of declining suburbs, there are a lot of poor suburbs, there are a lot of new suburbs that are being built that can't sustain themselves. A lot of suburbs are much worse off uh, than central cities. There, there's a lot of black suburbs and Chinese suburbs and Latino suburbs. This is not what the old kind of 50s notion of suburbia does not look like America. Uh, and so there's actually a real common interest if the cities began to talk to each other about changing rules which are actually hurting most of them. And it's, this is not just also just a question of ganging up on the, what's sometimes called the favored quarter, those suburbs that uh, are, are, are doing best, because those people also very much are fighting growth. They want to close down a lot of development in their area. So but the development is going places where people don't want it, and it's not going where people want it. And it's going some places and not other a lot because of the struggle the way we've set up the system of these suburbs with each other. So reaching out within the metropolitan Boston, although a lot of people think it's not going to be easy, and I think it's not going to be easy, one could imagine as possible. Uh, what that would mean if you're located in Jerusalem gets a lot more complicated. But it seems to me that the problems of the city of Jerusalem cannot be divorced from the problems of Palestine and Israel. They can't be divorced from the conflicts that are already around them. Conflicts within and conflicts without are all part of the same process and you can't isolate one city and then work on it. So they have to develop in terms of a relationship, not only a relationship with strangers within the borders, but also a relationship ar around the area in order to gain power, because the way to gain power is to seize control, if you can put it that way, of the nation state. And the way to seize control of the nation state is have the subdivisions of the nation state, namely the cities, ally with each other in the National Assembly and vote it out. I want to contrast this notion with secession. The alternative idea of, a, of uh, trying to relate the cities to the nation state is secession. Somehow the city is going to secede from the nation state. We don't quite know how it's going to be able to do that. But let's imagine it was successful. If, just take Jerusalem, if Jerusalem could secede and become its own, what would its relationship be to its neighbors? The idea at that point is seemed to me not worked out. There has to be, it becomes a question of international relations. 
So, I mean, the, the place of secession that I studied is, you may know about this if you're from the area, San Fernando Valley wanted to secede from the city of Los Angeles. Uh, if San Fernando Valley had seceded from the city of Los Angeles, it would have been the seventh largest city in the country, the valley itself. So it's, it was not a, a lunatic idea. Uh, first of all, who can decide whether or not Los San Fernando Valley secedes? Who could decide? Well, the way they set it up is the people from San Fernando Valley had to vote for it. But the people from Los Angeles as a whole had to vote for it, too. Because you can't have just one of the places decide to secede without, which would have a big impact on the people left behind, without having their say. If you did that, the next thing that would happen is that some various cities like Tarzana in, 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 the, in the valley would secede from the valley. And then the neighborhood would secede from the neighborhood. You have to have some consent of outsiders. Uh, well, it passed very quick, very, very uh, slightly. In the, when, when, it, when it went to the electorate, the San Fernando Valley voted for secession. Basically 50-50, 51-49, it was very close. But overwhelmingly, the city of Los Angeles voted against it, and therefore there was no secession. One of the things, if you think about had it worked, what would have been the relationship between San Fernando Valley and Los Angeles? We would now have had two cities. That relationship can be worked out within one. These people are part of the city of Los Angeles. So is Hollywood, which actually had a vote to secede at the same time. You could work out the relationship between these parts and the whole within the same unit. So here, Los Angeles is serving for me like the nation state uh, and its collection of cities, that there's no escape from working with outsiders because whatever one does affects them. And secession is not an answer to it. So you have kind of two areas of focus. One is to think about the city as a social place. Thing is, one of the things that a lot of us like about cities are it, their mix of people, the vitality, the public places, the excitement of living in a place that has diverse people, that has strangers that one comes across uh, in an ordinary course of an ordinary day. Many places are, are, are built, not built like that. This kind of diversity is to be nurtured, but it's to be nurtured not by isolating that place from uh, outsiders, but by relating those strangers to the other strangers. So that's my basic proposal. I'm happy to discuss any aspect. As I said, we're going to turn it over to Nomi now, and then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions and start a discussion among us. Um, I'm going to have to move into the middle. Good evening. Uh, first of all, before you get excited, I indeed did run for mayor of Jerusalem. I was the first woman to run for mayor of Jerusalem in 1998. I succeeded in accumulating 4.9% of the vote, and I was uh, roundly defeated. Uh, I have not given up, but I suggest another woman try again in 10 years' time. Uh, second point before I begin to try to make connections or actually point out divergences, um, Jerusalem is an incredible city. It's, despite my accent, I was born and brought up in Jerusalem and lived there and actually just landed a week ago, so uh, I'm getting used to your weather. <laughs> and, and also, frankly, um, to the language. So if every once in a while I lose a word, you'll forgive me. Um, Jerusalem's a magnificent city, but it seems to be unusually prone to being treated as history or as vision, but not as reality. And for me, Jerusalem is also very much a real place, it's not in the past and it's not in the future. It's very much in the present. And what we do in the present will, in many respects, shape and mold 
the way the city looks in the future. And so I wanted to ground at least myself because I'm still f suffering from jet lag, but also to a large extent the discussion. I will go very quickly in a number of points and I apologize if I import to Cambridge, Massachusetts some of the traits of uh, Israelis, which is brashness and rudeness. I, I, I apologize ahead of time so that I'm covered. <laughs> um, at first class, there's almost no connection between the lecture we heard and Jerusalem. <laughs> and I think it has to be said in order to see whether one can, in one way or another, actually um, learn a lot, not a little, a lot from the very crafty and sophisticated uh, presentation that we heard from Professor Frug. I think on second thought there's some interesting questions, partly because of similarities, but mostly because of very stark differences. And therefore I will run through three sets of uh, points of con convergence and divergence and relate specifically to Jerusalem. Number one, I want to deal with the assumptions. I think um, that Professor Frug, with all due respect, dealt with the concept of the city in a very Western sense. And Jerusalem is not a Western city. Many people like to treat Jerusalem as a Western city, but in many respects it's not Western at all, although a lot of the problematics are rooted in European history Jerusalem is not a Western city, and a lot of the general comments related to the United States or to Europe have very little to do with the Middle East or African cities that I know or cities in Asia. So that's point number one on the assumption. I think the greatest element, something that was not presented orally but is in your writing, is that the separation between private and public in the Western European and American cities is much less noticeable in Jerusalem and in Middle Eastern cities that I know. Cairo. I wish I knew Damascus better, but that's coming. Your sense of humor is dropping. <laughs> <laughs> Second assumption that I think, again, is a matter of great divergence is that in almost the entire discussion, there is an assumption that the city is part of a nation state or the state. I prefer the term state. And therefore, if there are struggles between the state and the city, there are struggles over sovereignty or autonomy or space, but within an acceptable political framework. In Jerusalem, as we know very well, there is a struggle over sovereignty. Jerusalem is the focus of a struggle for sovereignty. And therefore, there is no acceptance of the national framework in which Jerusalem is embedded today. There are competing aspirations for sovereignty which are located specifically in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, there is one city, which is the largest Israeli city, and at the same time the largest Palestinian city. It is the capital of Israel, and it is the capital of Palestine. And it's all in one place. And therefore, the working assumption that the state is a legal concept Sorry, the city is a legal concept, is part of the nation state, but cannot escape the nation state, is actually confounded in this context of Jerusalem. At least, if I didn't misunderstand you, I see a real problem here. And I'm not entirely sure that the way to deal with the problem is to liberate Jerusalem from competing sovereignties, but maybe to recognize competing sovereignties in order to liberate Jerusalem. But that is something that we can discuss in another context. So I'm not sure the working assumptions are similar, 
But because I'm not sure they're similar, I think the differences raise very interesting questions. Second point, the problematics. And here I see more similarities, if I may. Um, the general trend in the United States and in Europe is determined, penetrating state control over cities. And you point this out very well in your writing and in your presentation. And in, in Jerusalem today, there is tremendous Israeli control over what is going on in the city, in all parts of the city. That means in terms of housing and in terms of administration, but in terms of residence as well, and in terms of border. And the most difficult example, I, th I find it extremely problematic, of Israeli state control over what is going on in the city is the recent beginning of the construction of an eight meter wall in the Abu Dis area, but actually, which eventually will circle the city. So on the one hand, there is tremendous control over what is going on. On the other hand, so that agrees in a sense with the proposition. On the other hand, Jerusalem is a t terrific place to try to understand um, how you cope with an extremely hegemonic situation. And the Palestinian community, which is one third of Jerusalem, and the Haredi community, which is ultra-Orthodox Jewish, another 30% of the city leaves very little for the rest of us, have found ways of creating spaces of community that avoid, to a large extent, state control. There is a Palestinian police system. There is a Palestinian welfare system. There is a whole informal system of government in Jerusalem which is not state controlled and which is beyond the control of the state. Which leads us to a question, what is the relationship between state control and state power. They're not the same. And Jerusalem is a tremendous example of that confusion. The same goes, I really do think the informal networks have to be um, real examined. There are par parts of Jerusalem where Israeli police and Israeli authorities simply have no control whatsoever, or though the force of Israel is everywhere felt. In the same way, Professor Frug suggested that part of the problematic is that cities are powerless. And again, Jerusalem in the Israeli context is a perfect example because the state and the city are conflated. Very often, even the language Jerusalem and Israel have the same connotation. And therefore, Jerusalem as a city is powerless because whatever happens there is not only determined by the state, but essentially relates to the national level on the one hand. On the other hand, I'm going to confuse you on purpose. On the other hand, what happens and what is done in Jerusalem manipulates the state all the time. All the time. Vide, the person who beat me in the elections, Ehud Olmert, uh, as I said, really hurt. He is now a deputy prime minister. Purposely encouraged, without government support initially, the construction of a Jewish housing in the center of Palestinian areas of residence and compelled the government to accept Jerusalem policy as national policy. 
So, is the city powerless? On the one hand, Jerusalem is the most powerless city I know. And on the other hand, it is extremely powerful. And I suggest to you that I wouldn't have thought of it in those terms if I hadn't read and heard this presentation. And the final element I want to discuss very quickly is prescription. The main prescription we heard is a prescription of a metropolitan Jerusalem or metropolitan city to overcome the tug of war between the city and the state. Uh, the notion of a metropolitan Jerusalem has been floating around for many years, but very much in the past few years. Uh, I'm very wary of it. it presumes that national identities will disappear if a regional identity is formed. I don't see that happening in Jerusalem, unfortunately. And it entrenches at the moment Israeli hegemony, which I find unacceptable. It is a poor prescription for good relations between Palestinians and Israel. But it is possible if there is a two-state solution. In the context of a two-state solution, it might be possible. So the prescription of a metropolitan area is intriguing, but I think not applicable, but very visionary. The uh, uh, other prescription which you negated of secession is um, reminds me of the notion of a corpus separatum, which was suggested for Jerusalem in 1947-1948. You know what? Solve the problem. Make Jerusalem independent. And maybe there'll be divine sovereignty, I don't know, as a way of resolving these competing sovereignties. Um, frankly, it sounds very good, and the Vatican is still very immersed in this notion but I suggest it's not applicable as well. So um, leaves us with a dilemma, which is an intriguing dilemma that comes out of the prescription or the types of prescriptions we've heard, and that is how does one magnify and increase cooperation between competing national groups in Jerusalem while recognizing the possibility of political separation. So how do you separate politically but increase cooperation within an urban setting? I leave you with a question. Thank you. that I think we have two great presentations to get the conversation started. So I would like to open it for your commentary. Question, comment among yourselves to the speakers, whatever. I'm going to really leave it open to you. Or, yes. You said you're, you're You'll have to speak up loudly because it's hard to hear. Your concern with home rule and the reason that you're opposed to it is because it, it makes the, the city only deals with what affects locals, and the state only does what affects what the state can only do what affects non-locals, and so there's a problem with that. What I said is that the, the idea of home rule, when it means autonomy, can only mean that it would have autonomy over local matters. That was, in other words, no one would ever envision local autonomy over matters that were not local, over statewide matters. What I said was the problem was it's very hard to isolate any matter that you would actually be able to defend as local against a contrary state decision. So we have in the United States many, 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 many cases across the country of people who want to assert that this is a local matter. The state asserts, no, actually a lot of people are affected besides the local, and the state wins those cases. So. My concern is that the problem is with the definition of, a, of being able to isolate a local concern. 
in a world in which everything is so interrelated, the economies are interrelated, the transportation system is interrelated, people move across borders, the housing systems affect each other, uh, everything affects everything. Very, very hard to find the local that you would allow only the local to decide independent of larger interests. That's, and that's the home rule notion, is you have to find something that you're willing to give them on their own. So, I mean, it's, it's not, it, it's a, in, in, in the world in which we live, it's a very hard road, a hard uh, thing to do. Too much ambiguity that tends to favor the state over the city. Home, home rule has, has a lot of ambiguity because the ambiguity is what is a local matter. And that tends to favor the state. Uh, and so one of the things that we did is we uh, interviewed the 101 mayors and city managers of the uh, who uh, run the cities in Metropolitan in Boston and asked them the question, what is it that you can now do without going to the state? And the answer is very, very little. Very, very little. And then the point, the point is it's not surprising when you think of it. It's not surprising when the state says, well, actually it matters what's happening out on 128 to, to Boston. They're not making it up, it does, and vice versa. Fascinating, excellent Good presentations. As a political scientist sitting here, though, uh, Professor Fruit, you mentioned this idea of regional government, and you, you move very quickly past this, this kind of, well, this sort of majoritarian. Uh, yeah. And the one thing a political scientist thinks when they hear that is, well, you know, we know that, so we have these, re this region that incorporates distinctive, often place bound groups with yeah. distinct interests, yeah. um, but there are these externalities as they pursue these interests. We need yeah. some way to capture them, uh, cooperation rather than competition. Yeah. Um, but we know that simple majoritarian procedures under those sorts of environments tend to be very good at making decisions, but not very good at including a lot of different. Voices. Yeah, yeah. And we that, know that more representative systems yeah. tend to be very good at bringing in voices and not very good at making decisions. Yeah. Yeah. So I agree and, with that. And so, I mean, I, I, it's true. I went over it very fast. I don't actually propose, this is in my article Beyond Regional Government, I don't propose a simple majority system. I proposed what they call in the European Union a qualified majority. I propose supermajority rules so that you have more consensus within the majority. The, pro the problem is now we think about interlocal relations as all the local localities can, if they want to, get together, which is a unanimous consent rule. And we're not going to get unanimous consent. But I also agree that 51% is not enough. So I actually propose a whole series of different supermajority rules so that we represent not only a large percentage of the population, but a diverse set of the population uh, in order to get a major consensus short of unanimity, short of unanimity. And that's, so it's, so democracy is, I mean, you know better than I, is a very complicated concept. It depends on the voting rules and lots of other rules. So I actually propose detailed different rules than just simple majority for that reason. We need a, a relatively large consensus and, and exactly how to set that up. Too much consensus, you can't do anything. Too little consensus, it, it becomes uh, a vehicle for uh, the domination of the few over the many, so. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you were saying that um, Western cities are very different from um, Eastern cities. Um, and I, I understand that it makes more sense. I would like to know one way. Because I, uh, because I feel like it has a lot of bearing on what you're saying. Because I, I feel like we can only, uh, those of us who haven't left the Western Hemisphere very much, if we don't have a framework of thinking about that. Because I know that Israel and I mean, Jerusalem is very different from anything I can imagine, just because of all the fighting and because of the political conflict. Like, is there, how, how are the consistent? Uh, I'll, I'll answer very briefly. I, by the way, have a, I, I have to stand because I, I have to see my audience. Um, I, I am not in urban studies. I'm a political scientist. I can go into great length about the pros and cons of majoritarian and representative <laughs> systems and, and, and probably have written boring things on the subject. But uh, 
I was thinking it of of uh, Jerusalem, our Middle Eastern cities, very much in a political sense. And I think also that the key point that was made was a political point. Um, a, a city like Jerusalem uh, came into being specifically as a capital of ancient Israel or Judea at the time. Okay, but it's undergone amazing political mutations. It's preceded the state. It's superseded the state. It has transcended the state over the years. So in other words, its relation, the relationship between the state and the city has varied several times over the past 2,000 years that we know about. Now, you can't say that about Boston, Massachusetts. That's the point I was making. I want to take a point that Naomi mentioned that uh, about to respond. I think Naomi, primarily one area you mentioned about these communities that are surviving or making their own domains. And as you said, the difference between political control and political power, that's because the state is in charge, the state controls I'm reminded of many cities from the following countries, so the periphery of the city where land, people issue the land, etc. People are making a living, and the state, though they say they control, they really don't control. And the question I have is, can we think of areas that where absence of law is a positive thing? I know you come from a legal background, without creating lawlessness. Can, it be a, can absence of law be a strength? Well, it's not exactly absence of law, right? It, 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 law is always there in the background, ready to act if the people with the power want it to act. So the, the law withdraws, and things happen without state intervention. So the very the puzzling combination that you were saying about how everything is under Israeli sovereignty on the one hand, and yet a lot is happening without Israeli control on another. How is that happening? Is the state, the, the state withdraws and lets things happen. Now, there's a lot of that that happens in Boston. I mean, the state is not involved in day-to-day -day decisions about lots of things that radically affect uh, the future of the Boston uh, city and of the Boston area. Uh, you mentioned the public-private distinction is one of the ways this, this does. The, the state does not get involved in a lot of the decisions about economic decisions, about companies coming and going, and who's hired and not hired, which affects the future of the city. Uh, can this be positive? You bet. Can it be negative? You bet. Uh, it's a very complicated thing, and there's always a constant tension between uh, trying to figure out whether to intervene or not intervene, but they certainly don't intervene at every moment. There's an enormous amount of what happens day to day in all these cities that is not being controlled by the government of the, of the state. And one thing I just want to make a one comment on your comment, which I very much admired, uh, which is if it's very complicated to think about the relationship between a city and a sovereign, Think about the relationship between a city and two sovereigns. Uh, so one thing is the two sovereigns are going to have to deal with each other. What if the two sovereigns dealt with each other in a way that they liked, but the city didn't like? So, so it becomes extremely complicated to try to think about a relationship between a city and a divided sovereign, which is one of the ideas that, that uh, I know is being put forward, uh, trying to figure out. And that's where I think, therefore, the future uh, has, has a relationship to the whole is, becomes extremely important. Yeah, I wanted to go back to Naomi uh, for a moment and try to connect the, the beginning and the end of the presentation. Uh, which I, I enjoyed very much. But on the front end, you said that Jerusalem is particularly unusually, you said, prone to being treated either as history or as a vision. Um, and you, you made, I thought, a perfectly reasonable point that the city in the present. But what I didn't get was what the present looks like from the inside. 
uh, in a way, I'm asking for some support for your claim that um, that a dual a dual sovereignty that a metropolitan solution. At the end of the talk, a metropolitan solution can only work in a two-state context. So I feel like we've been looking from the outside in, and I want to know what the present looks like from the inside out, and why you think that the two-state solution is the only one that's plausible, given other alternatives. Thank you for that uh, question. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, so I'll answer. First of all, I must have been an abysmal failure because I was trying to describe Jerusalem mostly as it is today. Uh, and uh, trying to move from there to where it, I think it's going. So I'll try to elucidate where I was obtuse and then answer your question in such a way uh, that I won't make a total fool of myself. Um, I really think there are two systems going on in Jerusalem. There is a formal system and there is an informal system. And the informal system has its own laws and its own rules. And I use the term laws and rules and norms which permit people to function and things to work even though they're not always written down. Uh, the best example, and it's a very controversial one, is look at the temple, Mount. The bottom, and uh, the western wall is under Israeli rule. Everybody accepts this. And the top of the Mount, where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is under the control of the waqf. Now it's not written down anywhere that this is the way it's supposed to be or this is the way it is because formally Israel annexed the entire city including the Temple Mount. But for, since 67 there's this informal division of labor working which works very well indeed. The question is how can it be institutionalized? And daily life I'll give you another example. If you go from Mount Scopus, the Hebrew University, in the direction of Ramallah, you will hit, within five minutes, a, a checkpoint, which is known as the Aram checkpoint, which is within the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem. You would have to pass that checkpoint and go another two kilometer, kilometers in order to hit the checkpoint out of Jerusalem. The only thing is that this first checkpoint, anything beyond it, is fully 100% Palestinian. No Israelis go there unless they're invited. You rarely see an Israeli presence there. And life continues in an orderly manner. How? Because somebody is controlling the way that portion of the city is operating, which is not what you see formally. So hopefully that elucidated a little bit, which leaves me with your question. How does a two-state solution solve it? I'm a great proponent of a two-state solution, and therefore I think that the way to deal with this confusing situation is to recognize the reality, institutionalize and legitimate this reality, and bring it to the fore, and I don't think this can be done in other than a two-state solution kind of context, but I'll talk about that more tomorrow. That's a pitch. I think, I think we take that, I agree so much with the concept, uh, as a legal concept, we take it as a, as perspective and analyze the status of Jerusalem before 1948, before Israel was established, and then we take Jerusalem between 1948 and 1967 when Jerusalem was East. Jerusalem was uh, occupied by Israel. I think we will find your concept very interesting and very, very right at the same time. Before 1948, many people were attached to Israel from around the world. And Muslims, Christians, uh, and Jewish people around the world and inside the city itself. And the city was not 
was not nationalistic, and the city has no law, in fact. And the, because the absence of law, and because of the absence for many years, for hundreds of years, of a strong national state there, was changing rule from the Ottomanic, then the British mandate, then, then, then. Because of the absence of law, the city was so powerful. The people in the city itself meant their life, and each community, you know very well, to make any special, social, special analysis of the status of Jerusalem for her, for many years, we find that that the absence of law, the absence of the coercion of the central government helped the city to be strong, and the city was in very good shape. When this nationalistic conflict began between uh, between Israel and the Palestinians, the, the, the situation of Jerusalem became very, very bad. And just to give literally the, the notion of the legal status, the legal the city as a legal concept, and to, just to give some some laws that were enacted in the between 1967 till now. Few, few, just a few of them. Just I, I just remember the first one, 1967, the annexation, which no man mentioned, annexation of the other part of Jerusalem, 1980, Jerusalem as a capital of Israel, as a basic law. 81, 81, it's as a basic law, and it's very, and then. In 2002, I think the law of Israel, which prevents the government to withdraw from the East Park. And then we have today, in the last, this is the first government that we have, the Ministry of Jerusalem. Is that right? We have the Ministry today of Jerusalem. And this is the first time in the history that we have a Ministry of Jerusalem. And we have the District Planning Commission, and etc., etc., etc. So we have a lot, a lot of institutions, a lot of laws that prevent the city to act as as, uh, as it should act, uh, as a community. And the, the other part, uh, my final uh, comment, in short, it's about um, the 200, 300,000 uh, Palestinians who live inside Jerusalem. So these people, it's very important to mention, when you discuss Jerusalem, that these people are not the citizens of Israel. And they don't have any citizenship, in fact. And they have residency, residence. That means residence, that means that you can move inside the city, you can move some certain things, but you cannot work for, for the government. And uh, there is a lot of denial. Like many friends, many people who try to move from Jerusalem to go to Jordan, Egypt, or any to come to United States, because they don't have citizenship. They are residents. They cannot uh, do do that. So what happened, in fact, just to to, to, to summarize, what happened, in fact, that uh, uh, like when the city was international city before 1948 was strong, and today the, the, the state of Israel enforced the attachment of, of, the, of the city to the, to the state, to the law. I think it's very interesting because just focusing on the United States, there's been a similar historical process that the, the, the city is the legal concept as I describe it, is a process in which the state has asserted more and more power over time. And that, if you know the history of uh, America, the cities came before the state. We had, they founded the cities before the state. And, and, and in the colonial times, uh, the cities were much more powerful than the state. So there was a history of assertion of authority over and over again, which was buttressed by judicial decisions and uh, ultimately consolidated power in the city. So there's a, there's a history in the United States that's parallel to the story you told. The other thing that's a parallel to the story you told is disenfranchisement within city borders. You have to realize that a lot of American cities, a very substantial portion of the population are not citizens of the United States and therefore get no vote in city elections. You also have to realize that in the 19th century, uh, non-citizens had votes in municipal elections in the United States. And there's still some cities in the United States that, in which non-citizens can vote, not in national elections, in municipal elections. In Europe, people within the European Union, a national from uh, Italy living in Marseille votes in the Marseille election even though they're not a national of France. If we enfranchised people who are not citizens, it would change the politics of a lot of American cities. It's something that's been done and we could do. So we also have a problem similar to that. Um, 
we have a couple. There's Oprah, there's John. I'm going to throw myself in there, and then you, and maybe we'll. Oh, and our, our Tokyo. First of all, I'd like to say. Louder, it can't be louder. First of all, I'd like to say that just like Naomi, my accent is misleading because I was born and bred and lived most of my life in Jerusalem. But uh, regardless, I'd like to um, address the issue of uh, your notion of the city as a legal entity. Um, I think that uh, you were implying both in reference to uh, the whole cities of London and New York, as well as to the local situation of Massachusetts, that um, the, this issue, the legality or the legal issues of the city actually are residual to the issue of the city as an economic uh, entity. Um, and um, I think that going back to trying to transpose this issue to Jerusalem over and beyond what known, the reservations of known about and, and uh, applying your ideas to Jerusalem, I think that we should remember that Jerusalem is um, the poorest city in, in, in Israel uh, by any statistical. No, this year it's the poorest. The last year it is the second poorest, and as far as I've read, it's a, okay. <laughs> it's either the, the, the poorest or the second poorest city in Israel. And again, some, we should remember that um, in trying to apply it. I would like to emphasize another issue which was brought up by the question of the non-Western idea of, uh, of the city and with specific reference to Jerusalem. I, I think it should be remembered that Jerusalem, I think throughout most of its history, has been, and that's very unique just to Jerusalem, is that it's been um, a religious or a cultural entity. And I can emphasize that by the, the, by the mere fact that throughout most of its history, Jerusalem was actually, not many people know that, but a mere village or even less than that. And it's just what people would um, assume it to be, or would want it to be, or would wish it to be, that has actually produced this um, base of con conflict and contention that we know today. Um, let me stand up to pose a question which, based on having never been to Jerusalem, but absolutely intrigued by its function. Now we mentioned two phenomena. One phenomenon of power and powerless. And the second, the working relationships to establish at the top of the hill, at the bottom of the hill, are sustained by different communities in the trust, possibly, and that there are other phenomena manifestation of trust. And my question is a metaphorical one. And Harold may have an idea about this as well. Is there a currency which could be made available to establish more of those relationships of trust, a currency of reward and responsibility that couldn't imagine transcend in any way such as we find the seeds of the most local domains of existence, transcend the deeper visions. And I, my, my metaphor extends a little bit more to the top of the Hancock building here in Boston has something called tomb mass dampers. Whenever a storm or wind approaches, and rush to the other side of the building to stop it from swaying. Is there an equivalent of a tune to mass damper or some currency which can be made available in large amounts to dampen and eventually diminish and eliminate these differences for the sake of the Jerusalem that clearly everybody is very fond of? I definitely will get up for this one. Um, I tell you, I find your question very poignant and and um, and in a sense extraordinarily profound, because I think you've framed the the question that concerns many of us: is how do we find a way of creating either places or means of overcoming the extraordinary conflicts that are occurring in Jerusalem. I, I, I think when we pose it, 
that question in, in a stark form. It's a question not just for Jerusalem. It's a question not just for Palestinians or Israelis. I really think it's a universal question. And if we can crack the problem in Jerusalem, find that, I don't know what you called it, that, what's it called, that? <laughs> You'll have to explain it to me, but it sounds like something that balances the unbalanceable, and that's what we're looking for. Uh, then, then I think a lot of that can be transferred and transmitted. The truth is that the problem is much deeper than it perhaps was conveyed either by Yosef or Ofer or myself today. <clears throat> Look, I was born in Jerusalem in 48. My first memory at the grand age of two, and do not tell me that you know mathematics at MIT, <laughs> is the siege on Jerusalem in 48. I, my, my childhood, somebody smiled, my childhood uh, was in a divided city with a wall, whereas kids we used to peep through the bullet holes to see what's on the other side, in, in the wall itself. Um, and they came down. And so my adult life, I've lived in a Jerusalem without a wall. And I want you to know that I do not recall Jerusalem being as divided as it is today. In every real sense of the term, economically, socially, religiously, in pure human terms. There is virtually no contact between the various portions of the population and people know the boundaries within the city without there being any boundaries. And therefore the question you posed is even more difficult to resolve than it might appear from the earlier presentation. <clears throat> I don't know what the tune mass damper would be, but I know what the opposite is, which is the isolation that you're talking about. And we, we in here in uh, the Boston metropolitan area, we also know the neighborhoods we don't enter uh, in all sorts of directions. We don't have the checkpoint, but we don't need the checkpoint. There are places that you don't go, uh, and there are places that other people don't go. And if you walk, the, to walk down a lot of, of the major kind of commercial areas in Boston, knowing that it's a majority minority city, you would never know it when you see it. And you want to know, where are all these people? Uh, so we are building a divided America. It's divided by neighborhood within the city of Boston, and it's divided by jurisdiction within the 101 cities. Uh, and people can name by zip code the kinds of people who go and don't go. And I think this is, uh, this, this created isolation reinforces each other and causes tension. Here, uh, I don't say that it's comparable to the tension in Jerusalem, but it's analogous. I'm going to call on myself and then Arturo, and then I think we're going to have to wrap it up. So I'm, um, but we'll be able to talk a little among ourselves and hopefully carry the conversation on for a couple weeks. I just wanted to kind of pick up on this last idea, or actually the, a crescendo of ideas that have been generated, but I'm struck, I was very much struck, Nomi, by your comment about the distinction between state control and state power, and the fact that there is, in essence, a shadow state of, of Palestinian state with police and welfare, et cetera, that's already that exists within Jerusalem. And I'm thinking, again, to bring it to this last comment, that what makes, that is really the problematic and the challenge. It's not just so much that the space is divided. It's also the institutions of law, the informal rule of law, in the informal state, <coughs> that is really divided. And even your analogy that when, when the city was clearly divided, it didn't feel as divided as it is now when it's more fragmented. Now, the, the, what, what I wanted to pose to all of us, but to you, you know, too, is this idea that, okay, well, let's recognize this, that basically you're saying that already there are two states in the city. It's almost like turning it upside down the way we started the discussion, which is there's two states trying to pick up the city 
be hegemonic of the city. Well, within the city, there are two states already informally, two states that are coexisting, and the two state solution is to acknowledge and recognize that. And I think that the, the question I wanted to ask is whether that's really the solution for the city. And maybe the solution for the state problem, the nation state problem, but is that the solution for the city? And the reason that I ask that question is it makes me think, just to bring in another city, it's very different than um, Jerusalem, the city that I know best, Mexico City, where if you look at space and power and politics, the very same thing is happening between the formal powers of the state and the police and the formal rule of law and the informal sector, which has their own police and their own state, and they, they control space. And the solution to that is not to recognize both of them, in a way, because there would never be any commonality, there would be no democratic deliberation between them. You would just fragment and fragment and fragment both of those spaces, those sets of systems differently, but maybe to think about how they can be transformed in relationship to each other, rather than just accepting that you should have in one city different states existing, but to get them to put, this is maybe Frug's idea, to put, to decide among themselves to create the institutions to bring the outside within to work together in the city, rather than acknowledging the informality and the difference and just dividing the city. So that was the, the, my, my comment. Well, just for the sake of time, just to elaborate that question. I yeah. also think that uh, the solution of, is a, a two-state solution is not a solution. It's recognizing the conflict that we have now without going for the solution of the conflict. So uh, because you will you will still have two problems, two sovereign, two sovereigns, and you will also have a problem of the hegemony on both sides. How would you work out the set of rules for each one of the cities or each one of the, uh, of the government in order to cover their own problems if, you, if everything is interstate or real time? So you have to think about a, another kind of solution to that. And, but I, I also want to elaborate a little bit more on so, the last, uh, just if you could just make a brief part, more, a little more of a bigger argument about your, your idea of regional or something like that. Let me just add two points. Cities have become also very important in contemporary politics, but also in the contemporary world, there are, I mean, in the globalization, corporations are getting to be one of the major players in politics and in the cities. So how do you cope with this thing? And then how would you also try to cope with this idea of supermajorities? Because what you would be producing in that way is hegemony in the city. And you really want that thing. Yeah, I mean, too many questions that are too important to be able to deal with in a short period of time. I, I think one of the puzzles that comes out of this discussion uh, is the relationship between the institutional city, the city is a legal concept, the government, the institution, the sovereign, the formal authority, and the city understood in many other ways the cultural city, the religious city, the lived city, the spaces that operate with outside uh, of formal institutions. It was really your, your questions. And one of the, th the, the, the methods of talking that we've had tonight is that we want to move from the informal, the social, the networks to the formal institutional level. And we should investigate why we want to do that and what we, what, what, what we get out of that particular form. Uh, the other thing is that form is not going to go away. That form has real <coughs> authority and also real lack of authority. And both sides uh, make a big difference to the solution to all these problems. Yes, uh, very quickly. Uh, number one, there may appear to be two states in Jerusalem, but one is a state and one is not formally a state. And unless we realize that, then we'll be missing the political point entirely. So that's number one. Number two, there is a possibility, uh, and many Jerusalemites, Palestinian and Israeli, have a feeling of citizenship of Jerusalem separate from citizenship of their mm -hmm respective states. Uh, how one develops and nurtures this into something more is a critical question. 
because there is a Jerusalem identity which is special to Jerusalemites and is very different than uh, residents of Tel Aviv or Ramallah. And it's that niche that I would suggest playing with in terms of the questions asked. And third, with all due respect, there has to be some kind of correlation between the solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict in general and the application of that solution in Jerusalem. And if there isn't some correlation, it doesn't have to be identical, but it has to be adaptable, then nothing is going to work. Because Jerusalem is a microcosm of the conflict, and it is different from the conflict. And it's the combination that one has to deal with if one is really confronting Jerusalem for the future. Okay, well, before we thank our both our, our speakers, I just want to remind people that we're not meeting next week because it's a holiday, but two weeks from tonight we'll be here in this room. We'll get all the technology set up so we can start close to 530. Um, our speaker will be Larry Vale, who's speaking on the temptations of nationalism in capital cities. And we're really hoping that you'll continue to be committed and stay and help us keep this dialogue going. And I really want to thank Gerald and Nomi for really doing a lot of